Hello everyone. Today we will be discussing few questions that are related to previous topics which is matter. Is matter around us pure and atoms and molecules? So as we have understood so many topics, it's time to revise few questions so that it will be really helpful for understanding and give the answers to different questions. So let's quickly start. So the question number one we will be discussing. What are the characteristics of particles of matter. So we have discussed this before as well. Let's quickly answer this. So the different characteristics of particles of matter, they are the first one. You can let me just write down the first one. There are presence of intermolecular spaces. Spaces are present in between the particles of matter. So I'm just writing down the major keywords that will be easier to understand. The second point will be the second characteristic of particles of matter will be they are in constant motion. The particles of matter are in constant motion. They are constantly moving either on its own places or uh, different places as well. The third characteristic of particles of matter that they are able to attract each other. So there is a force of attraction between each other. So they attract each other so and the fourth one will be all matter is they are dependent on everyone on every particle so yes they have to combine with another particle so that it can exist independently so these are four characteristics of particles of matter there has to be intermolecular spaces so we has under we have already understood that matter anything which occupies space and has mass. So the particles has to be there which have space and they are constant motion, they can attract each other and they have to combine so that they can exist independently. So this is the question number one that we have discussed. Let's quickly move to the next question. Tabulate the differences in the characteristics of matter. This is the most most important question that we're going to understand is mostly this type of a question do ask in the paper also where we have to write down the differences in between characteristics of particles of matter which is solid, liquid and gases. So let, let's move and understand the solids, liquid and gases. So one by one we will be writing down. First let's talk about solids. For solids let's understand its first characteristic which is gonna talk about shape. So yes, of course, the solids are having fixed shape. Let's talk about liquids. They're not having fixed shape as we can keep a particular volume of water in a glass, in a container, in a bucket. So yes, that takes the shape of that whole particular object. So that's why the liquids are not having fixed shape as they are having a lot of space in between the particles of the matter. Now let's talk about the gases. The first point, yes, of course, they also do not have fixed shape. So this is the first point for solids, liquids and gases. Let's move to the next point, which is let's talk about volume. Second one is the volume. Yes, of course, solids are also having fixed volume. Either you all can write down these two points, shape and volume in a fun point, or you can also write down in a two points as well. So yes. Solids are also having fixed volume. So is the liquids as we have just understood that 100 ml water you have taken, 100 ml juice you have taken. So that also remains the same. Only the shape of a container will be different. Similarly, talking about gas. Yes, it is a bit different than solids and liquids as it also does not have fixed volume. It occupies the spaces in between a cylinder. So that's why it is there. Let's talk about the third one. The third characteristic which is intermolecular force how much attraction is there how much the particles of matter they are going to attract with each other so let's talk about the third one the third characteristic which is intermolecular force so yes as the solids they are very much closer with each other so that is why the particles are having maximum intermolecular force because 
in the solids the particles of matter they are very much closer with each other as they are having fixed shape also so the force of attraction between all the particles are also maximum let's talk about the liquids yes it is having stronger one as there are spaces but yes spaces are little bit greater than the solids so definitely it is having but it is definitely lesser than solids and the molecular forces are lesser than solids and in the gaseous state of matter we know that the particles of matter they are being spreaded very far away from each other so the intermolecular forces become almost negligible or we can say very very less so this was about the third characteristic of matter which is the intermolecular force now let's talk about the fourth characteristic which is intermolecular space so the space is actually the major major keyword and we have taken this characteristic and discussed with the shape as solids are having very lesser space in between the particles that's why they are having fixed shape they are fixed volume as the spaces are very less also the maximum intermolecular forces will be there yes we can write down they are having intermolecular space very very less in between the particles of matter where in the case of liquids yes it is more than solids the spaces are more than solids and in the gaseous we can say yes it is having maximum space in between the particles of matter i can write down i can draw the diagram of the particles of matter to indicate the solids liquids and gases so as you can see here the particles of matter in solids they are having very lesser space in the liquids yes they are having bit space in between and in the gaseous state yes they are very very far away so almost negligible uh, force of interaction and but the maximum spaces are there so let's talk about the rigidity also that's the last one the fifth one so yes in this rigidity for the case of solid it's very rigid it remains the same the same shape will be there it is very rigid yes in the case of liquids it can flow right so yes it is not rigid or we can say it can flow let's talk about the gaseous case yes similar they are not rigid they can flow so that is the differences in the characteristic of matter which we have just discussed differences between solid liquid and gases and this can be definitely asked in the paper for the uh, five mark question or four mark question or three mark question so all the characteristics of matter we have written and also according to that we have uh, differences in between the solids liquids and gases so this was the question number 2 let's move to our next question which is question number 3 so what type of mixtures are separated by the technique of crystallization so we're going to learn about this now we're going to answer this as well what type of mixtures are separated by the technique of crystallization so so basically the crystallization as the name suggest it is used to separate solid from the uh, liquid solution as we are able to crystallize it as we are able to make it crystallize and this is how the solids can be removed from a liquid solution so yes it is used i'll just write down the major keywords it is used to separate solids from a liquid solution okay so this was solids we are able to remove and how we are able to remove we are able to precipitate it by in this technique precipitation will be there so let's precipitate the crystals crystals are going to precipitate which are having very very high level of purity and this is a major major principle of crystallization which can actually uh, be used to actually been applied to purify impure substances so we have to purify impure substances so this is how technique of crystallization can be used to separate solids from the liquid solution so this was about the question number 3 let's move to the next question question number 4 i hope it is clear to everyone so let's move back to question number move to the question number 4 so question number 4 is also related to 
matter which is rigidity fluidity compressibility gas container and also the shape the kinetic energy density we have to uh, explain uh, in all these states of matter that how it is good how it is able to um, move different shapes kinetic energy so this is also very very important question uh, according to the exam point of view so we have to explain one by one all the characteristics and what does this characteristic means also so rigidity so basically rigidity it's a property of matter where uh, we have to understand that whether it is going to remain a matter is going to remain in its own shape or not so when we are treating that particular object of matter uh, with an external force so whether it is going to remain in that shape or not or whether it's going to mold so that explains that how rigid that object is so that is the property of being in rigidity so we have understood already in the previous question as well that rigidity for solids means the same as the particles of matter they are having lesser spaces in between that's why they are the force of attraction is very very high and they remains the same in the own shape so yes rigidity explains the whether the particular matter is going to remain in the shape when there an external force will be applied or not so this was about the first property rigidity let's move to the next one which is compressibility so compressibility is also being the same one as well as we are able to compress it down the particles are going to uh, whether contract or not so let me just write compressibility so we are able to compress the object so that means particles has to come back to the original place and they have to contract basically so that their intermolecular spaces gets reduced so if the external force is being applied so the particles are going to compress so if, if this original one and the external force is applied the particles now become very much closer so the spaces in between the particles of matter gets reduced here let's talk about the third one which is the fluidity so fluidity as the name suggest it is the ability to flow it is the ability of a substance of a matter to flow or move so as we can compare with the solids or liquids basically first of all so solids yes it does not uh, involve any fluidity any able to move as it's going to have very very strong rigidity and compressibility so that's why it does not have the characteristics to flow but yes liquids and gases they have the ability to flow from and they are having the ability to move as well let's talk about the next one which is filling a gas container so filling a gas container yes the particles in a container uh, they take the shape basically especially in the gas basically so gas container when there is a gas container and a gas is being filled inside the container or a cylinder the particles in this matter will be actually taking the shape so if a container is there the particles are going to take the shape as they are randomly vibrating as they are randomly vibrating moving to different different places so yes it's easier to fill up uh, the container and they are vibrating in all the direction in all the possible directions they can move so this is about filling a gas container let's talk about shape so we have already understood that yes it's a definite structure so yes it's a definite structure of an object which which have a particular boundary as well that indicates yes it's have a fixed shape so it's a definite structure with a boundary so this is the shape where the kinetic energy it's the very very important one the sixth one kinetic energy so energy the particles are requiring to move which is all, also related to the fluidity as well so the gases they have the maximum one solid liquid gases the gases has the maximum one the ability of the particles of matter to move where the as compared to liquid and gases liquid yes it is lesser than and solids is also lesser than so yes liquids are greater than solids and gases is greater than liquids so the kinetic energy so 
I hope it is clear. And let's talk about the last one, which is the density one. So the density of the particles of matter is basically indicates mass per unit volume. It's very, very important formula. Mass of, per un of a unit, volume of a substance. So this is the density indicates. So I hope this question number four is also cleared. Let's move to the question number five, which is also very much important. Which postulate of Dalton's atomic theory is the result of the law of conservation of mass? So first of all, this is the most important question as well. So we have to understand the Dalton's atomic theory and we have to understand the law of conservation of mass in this question as well. So yes, let's write down the answer to this question. So the relative number basically and the type of atoms are constant. So the number of atoms and the type of atoms, they are becoming constant in a particular matter, in a particular mass. So let's write down the relative number and types of atoms are constant in a given composition which is understood and told by Dalton's atomic theory which is based on this rule of conservation of mass. So yes, of course, atoms can not be created nor be destroyed in a chemical reaction. This is the most important postulate given by Dalton's atomic theory where atoms, the number and the types of atoms remains always be the same. That means the atoms cannot be created and not be destroyed. The most important part in this particular question. So I hope this is also being cleared. Let's jump to our next question, which is the most important one as well, uh, which can be asked definitely in the paper because we have understood the symbols, we have understood the elements, we have also understood about the chemical formula so that in grade 10 also we can write down uh, different reactions as well. So this is the most most important um, question here. So question number six indicates that write down the formula of different different compounds we have written here. So let's start with the question number one which is sodium oxide. So sodium oxide it is very easy just we have to first mention and follow the rules so first rule will be definitely we have to write down the symbol of sodium which is capital n small a and then we have to write down the symbol for oxygen okay so oxide yes it is oxygen first we will be writing down the symbols now we have to learn their valencies so we will be writing down in the next step again we will be writing down here Okay, and now we will be adding certain valency. So valency for sodium will be 1 and um, plus 1. And whereas the minus 2 valency will be there for the oxygen. Now we will be cross multiplying it for the second step. And now in this third step, we will be after cross multiplying, we will be writing the compound name which is sodium oxide which is Na2O. So this is sodium oxide A part. I hope it becomes easier. First, we always have to learn the symbols which we have understood the Basilius way of learning the symbols. Now, let's talk about for the B part. Let's understand which is aluminium chloride. So, yes, start with the first step. Follow the rules. Aluminium, capital A, small L, chloride, capital C, small L. So, chlorine and aluminium symbols we have written. Now, we will be giving valencies so add valencies into the symbols so aluminium valency is plus three whereas chlorine valency is minus one in this step only we will be doing cross multiplying then the chemical formula becomes as al aluminium chloride alcl3 which is aluminium chloride i hope it is clear let's move to the third one, the C part, which is sodium sulfide. Do not get confused with the sodium sulfur symbols. Have practiced lots of questions, other questions as well, so that it becomes easier for you to just simply read and just start writing the answers. So yes, sodium 
sulfide so sodium na and sulfide sodium symbol is capital n small a the sulfide will be s we will be taking s so that is the sulfate one we will be taking s sulfur okay so now we will be adding valency so sodium as we know which is having plus one and now the sulfur we will be taking as valency as minus two in the here only we will be cross multiplying so that becomes Na2S sodium sulfide that is the C part let's move to the D part I hope it is clear to everyone where the D part let's write down here magnesium hydroxide very very important magnesium hydroxide this is also a base that we will be covering in grade 10 so magnesium capital M small g hydroxide is capital O H capital O capital H or hydroxide okay so now this is the symbols now let's add valency so magnesium is having plus 2 whereas OH let's put it in the bracket so that we do not get confused it's having minus 1 the whole OH is having minus 1 valency so this is the valency let's do the cross multiplication so after doing cross multiplication let's write down the chemical formula which is MgOH now this whole 2 will become here as that's why this is the usage of having putting in OH as a in the bracket so that we do not get confused usually students like write like this so what does this indicates that the two atoms are combined with this hydrogen so that an oxygen is one one atom whereas magnesium is also one atom so this is the wrong one that's why it's always being advised that we should have OH as hydroxide if you're talking about we should keep it in the bracket so that we do not get confused and we write down the chemical formula in the correct way so that is the D part which we have solved which is magnesium hydroxide. So let's move to the next question which is question number 7. Why it's not possible to see an atom with the naked eyes? I hope we all know that uh, this matter is made up of small particles which is called the smallest particle is called as atoms. So yes as uh, the atoms they are very very small even beyond our, our imagination so definitely it cannot be seen through our naked eyes and they are even that much small that their radius has also been calculated in the nanometers units so yes let's write down the atoms are very small even beyond our imagination so yes they do not exist independently mostly atoms and that is why Yes, of course, and they are measured in nanometers. That's why, yes, it is not possible to see the atom with the naked eyes. So, I hope this question is also clear. Let's move to the question number 8. Why particles of the colloidal solution do not settle down when left undisturbed while in the case of suspensions too? So, here in this type of a question, how we have to understand and how we have to form our answer this is also very much important because we have to first understand that what the question is actually demanding and then we have to frame our answers so here we can see that colloidal solution it does not settle down so now we have to think about the reason behind it that why it does not settle down okay it's definitely it is having smaller uh, particle size right so we have to understand and we have to frame the our answers according to the particle size and we have to explain also in the suspension because we have to compare with the suspension so we have to come uh, understand and write down frame the answer for the suspension also because there is a there can be co comparison so that this particular question can be of two marks so we have to explain the particle size of both the suspension as well as colloidal one so this is how we have to first read the question understand the question and frame our answers in our mind and then we have to write it according to the marks it has been asked in the paper if it is for two marks definitely we have to explain the both if it's for one mark we can just write down uh, one one line for both the points so yes let's write down for of course we are comparing with the suspension so let, let's write down for both of them so the particle size in a suspension is larger 
of course they do not get mixed up the suspension solutions they do not get mixed up and uh, their particle size is very much larger they are do not able to mix it properly that's why they are settled down then is larger than those in a colloidal solution also the molecular interaction in a suspension is not that much strong because they are not able to dissolve in it right so let's write down that also that's why they are able to settle down so let's write down everything here also molecular interaction in a suspension is not strong whereas in the case of colloidal so solution it is strong and yes this is why they uh, they are able to keep the particles suspended and hence they settle down so we have compared both the size of the particles and where the colloidal one the suspension one and then we find out that yes suspension particle size is greater is larger and they are able to suspend uh, suspend and they are able to settle down so this was question number 8 i hope it is also clear so let's move to jump into the next question question number 9 which is from uh, atoms and molecules so as it can be of two mark usually so let's write down the differences and whenever differences type of a question do ask in the paper we always have to make a table and then we can draw a table give the names element and compound so if we talk about oxygen nitrogen helium hydrogen aluminum iron cobalt so they all are element so that means they all are made up of same kind of atoms so yes element is made up of i'm just writing down the keywords made up of same kind of all these substances which are made up of same kind of atoms are called as element this is how you can write down the whole definition in this compound as we have made the formulas as well chemical formulas aluminum chloride sodium oxide carbon dioxide all these compounds which we have made previously in the previous question as well that is made up of different kind of atoms oxygen is having different atoms sodium is having different atoms so we are combining them so this is how a compound will be formed where different kind of atoms are interacted here are going to form and make a compound let's write down the second point because two points has been asked where the element as it is made up of same kind of atoms we cannot split it we cannot go back to the original one as it's the one kind of atom only we cannot break it down when compound definitely we can uh, break that compound as it is having two elements consisting or more than two elements consisting by different physical or chemical methods as well so yes element i'm just writing down the major keywords it cannot be split by physical or chemical methods when well, the case of compound yes it can split into new substances by chemical methods so this these are the two points of differences between the elements and the compounds let's move to the next question which is liquids generally have lower density than solids but you must have observed that ice floats on water yes so if the ice is going to float on water that means ice is solid and if the solid is having lower density then only it will be floating right so yes this is a little bit twisting question but yes we have the answer let's quickly jump into the answer and write down the answer so yes definitely the volume here in the liquid is definitely more than the solid so let's write down volume first point there are many reasons behind it volume of a liquid is more than volume of solid because liquid particles are more freer they can move they can flow right as compared to the solid one and then this is why they are having more volume as compared to the uh, volume of solids so yes let's write down the second one and ice on the other hand basically it has maximum density uh, of water at 4 degree celsius where ice is lighter so ice is we can say lighter than water and if ice is lighter than water and has low as has density so the topic comes here with the density only so the 
ice is lighter and uh, it has lower density so that is why it floats on water so these are the two major points for this particular question let's move to the next very very important question difference between or distinguish between evaporation and boiling yes it's again the difference so we have to make a table let's try down the points evaporation and the second one is boiling let's find out the answer it's very very important question it can be definitely asked for two or for three marks only question so yes evaporation is a normal process that is being done uh, from the sun from the surface of the water okay so evaporation is normal process that occurs when liquid i'm just writing down the major keywords liquid form changes into gaseous form so here it is having the pressure or temperature has to be there like sun is evaporating water from the oceans so yes as there is a heat temperature pressure required so definitely that will be there for the evaporation case but boiling it's an unnatural process when the liquids gets heated up we boil the water in a pan on a gas stove so so the li whole liquid is getting heated up and it is going to vaporize it so let's write down liquid gets heated up so proper temperature has to be given to that particular water to boil up where in the evaporation no particular temperature not fixed temperature is there to evaporate the water so yes Uh, the liquid gets heated up and vaporized vaporized due to continuous heating so the continuous heating is there in the case of boiling so that it can vaporize it so this is the first point in difference between evaporation and boiling let's move to the next point the second point so evaporation the surface of the liquid gets converted into gaseous form because from the sun the it is going to land up and give the heat to the surface of the the front part the first part so suppose this is the water this is the sun so the heat of the sun will directly go to the first layer the surface layer not to the depth of the ocean the first layer so it is going to first heat the surface of the liquid where for the second case boiling it occurs the entire mass the whole water gets heated up so the entire mass of the liquid entire mass of the liquid gets heated up in the case of boiling this is the second point let's go to the third point and write down very important the third point so yes the bubbling effect which happens in the boiling when we boil the bubbling effect shows right which is not thus in case of the evaporation we do not see whether the water is going to evaporate how it is going to evaporate any other effects which are being visible no nothing is there so yes no bubbling effect where in the case of uh, boiling yes the bubbling effect is visible let's write down the fourth point and this process of evaporation is actually being slower very much slower uh, because it takes a whole day maybe as compared to the boiling so the process is slower where the process of boiling it actually takes lesser or a very very less time or uh, we can say 5 minutes 2 minutes depends upon what volume we have to boil up so yes it is quicker it is more quicker or faster yes these are the all um, the questions that we have discussed question uh, total 11 questions uh, we have discussed so thank you so much and i hope every question is being cleared